Hello everyone. Welcome to our reading session <clears throat> here at the library. So I'm glad you all or some of you are already here. Hope you will enjoy this um this session. Hello Winaki. Hmm. Thank you. Muffled voice. <clears throat> Muffled voice. No, that is the correct. Ah, uh, you. You may be right. There we go. All right. Is it a spacer? Welcome to the library. Nice. Okay, I'm glad we fixed it. And in a timely manner. Feels like look by look, you're a librarian. I five degrees is ten full uh i'm not a librarian and then not no come on we are just having a comfort reading session and uh this is just my grandfather's old library yeah we're listening to tchaikovsky hope you are enjoying it let me know if it's maybe too loud miwachan is going to read to us yes i will nipa God, I love that sticker. The libraries are very comfy. Um, yeah, I am too. I hope it will keep being a thing. So, are you all comfy with a coffee or a tea or a cup of water? Sitting on your favorite piece of furniture? It's gonna be in English. Otherwise, the entire session would be in Russian. I might do some uh, reading sessions in Russian if people will be interested. So, yeah. Just finished workout. Making tea. Gonna be a nice session. I have tea. Oreos. And I sit on the floor. Oh, wow. Sitting on floor pillows. That sounds very nice. Right. In this case, I hope you are ready to begin. I have uh, my copy of the Brothers Karamazov right here in front of me. It's um, it's a quite a lengthy book. I don't know if we'll finish it on stream. It all depends if you will be enjoying it uh, and you will like to do so because I really like this book. So. I would love to go through it, but let's see also how long my uh, throat deals with that. I am not very well trained speaking for long periods of time. Anyway, some background. So, of course, it was written by Dostoevsky. Um, a bit over 150 years ago. Oh, you just finished reading Pushkin. Which book? Which book, Juicy? I uh, I have a story about Pushkin that I may reveal at a later time, but uh, I'd just like to know if... Yeah, what, what poem or book by Pushkin have you read? He's one of my all-time favorite writers. One moment, trying to get comfortable here, cause my oh my camera is a bit weird. You know, we usually don't sit at the library, so yeah, placing it here is is a bit awkward. So, um, the Stovsky himself was um a devout believer, uh, but he not everyone around him was so, and he recognized that so. The book draws inspiration from a lot of biblical stories and ideas, but it is not trying to shill religion, so to speak. It's, you know, at the time it was quite an important part of the community. So a lot of literature was influenced by it, but it dissects these ideas in a very different way so 
you might want to look out for those uh, references if you are familiar with them. All right, so let's see. I'll read the back of the book first. Let's see how they describe it. Dostoevsky's final and arguably his greatest novel in a significantly revised translation by Susan McReynolds. Oh, significant, significantly revised. Well, yeah, I thought this book was a bit um, slimmer than the one I have read. It's a compilation of short stories from Pushkin, Dostoevsky, and other classic authors. Oh, that sounds very nice. I hope I hope you enjoyed it. Um. But if I had to guess, it's probably just revised in a way that it's more readable in the 21st century or so. I hope. Introduction names in the brother Karamazov and the Karamazov family tree, along with expanded explanatory annotation, expanded explanatory annotations. Three decades of Dostoevsky's letters and selections from the, his diary of a writer in which readers may trace the origins of this novel. Yeah, that novel also um, it was inspired a lot by himself. It's probably the closest novel to his own person. Is the music too loud, by the way? Is my voice too quiet? <clears throat> 13 critical essays from American, Russian and European authors. Chronology, a chronology of Dostoevsky's life and work and a selected bibliography. Freud is definitely not one of my favorite uh, psychologists, but there is a quote here from him. The Brothers Karamazov is the most magnificent novel ever written. And now someone who I look up to a bit more, there's a quote from Albert Einstein here. I am enthralled with The Brothers Karamazov. It is the most wonderful book I have ever laid my hands on. What a fine way to describe a book. All right, let's start. One moment. I need to find a good way to uh, hold the book. All right, I'm going to turn the mic this way. The editor Susan McReynolds is associate professor and chair of the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Northwestern University. She is the author of Redemption and the Merchant God, Dostoevsky's Economy of Salvation and Antisemitism. Her articles have appeared in philosophy and literature Partisan Review, Dostoevsky Studies, Slavic and East European Journal, and Literary Imagination. Okay, so it seems like the translator of this book has quite a, a wide experience with Slavic um, poetry and writing, so that's good. So, we have an introduction here. Um, would you guys want me to read the introduction or jump right into the book? Oh, the hallway. That sounds good to me. <clears throat> Dostoevsky's final novel caused a sensation when it began appearing as serial installments in the journal The Russian Messenger in January. 1879. People read the introduction, usually no, but in this case, since we are not living at the same day and time, I think it provides a lot of background, especially for people who are not familiar with his work or with all the Russian names and stuff like that, as they do have some differences. So, yeah. 
The brother's grandmother is producing a furor in the palace with the public and the public reading it, which, by the way, you will see in the newspapers, the note, he noted proudly. <clears throat> Many of its original Russian readers experienced the novel as a call to action. When Dostoevsky read from the Grand Inquisitor as a benefit for students of St. Petersburg University, he elicited such a favored response from the audience that the government placed the chapter under a ban forbidding any future public readings. Describing the urge for personal, social, and political renewal, the novel inspired, one reader wrote, hmm. After the Karamazovs, and while reading it several times, I looked around in horror and was amazed that everything went on as before, that the world did not shift on its axis. This is something to such a degree prophetic theory apocalyptic that it seemed impossible to remain in the same place where we were yesterday, to have the same feelings that we have, to think of anything other than the terrible day of judgment. Dostoevsky, this reader concluded, was indeed our social conscience. The regime, the regime I, the brothers Karamazov, wearily, but the rest of literate Russia including members of the Tsar's family, embraced it with fervor. Father Zosimo was welcomed into the Winter Palace at the request of Tsarevna uh, Maria Fyodorovna, wife of the future uh, Alexander III. Dostoevsky was invited to a small gathering in Grand Duke uh, Constantine's chambers in May of 1880. Dostoevsky read passages from the life of Zosimo before members of the ruling family, according to Konstantin, the Tsarevna had tears in her eyes. These were the striking features of the novel's first reception. Readers perceive it as a cataclysmic event, an eruption of something extraordinary into everyday life. The novel enjoyed broadly inclusive appeal, and many believed that it had something intensely vital and personal to say to each reader. I cannot find words equal to my feeling of gratitude for the pleasure I experienced and the benefit my soul received. One reader wrote Dostoevsky in December of 1880, I would very much like to repeat my words of gratitude personally. Thanks to Brothers Karamazov, it's possible to remake oneself and become better. Another reader confided in her diary in November of 1879. One moment. <clears throat> I'll try to turn on the light here in my room. I'm not certain that it will make a difference, but here we go. All right. <clears throat> The text we know as the Brothers Karamazov resulted from Dostoevsky's decision to fuse his plans for two novels, works he intended to call Atheism and the Life of a Great Sinner. Elements of their prospective hero are Russian who goes on a quest to recover his lost Christian faith, were eventually distributed among Dmitri, Ivan, and Alyosha Karamazov, discussing his plans for the life of a great sinner in 1870, Dostoevsky wrote, the main question, which will run through all the parts, is the very existence of God. The fundamental outline of this main question posed in the Brothers Karamazov, whether or not God exists, and if so, why he permits innocent suffering, remains accessible, thanks to us, to a decision pro or contra for Ivan's rebellion against God's creation or the Sima's affirmation of faith, through logical argumentation instead, the prosecution and defense of God proceed poetically and picturally. It is an enraptured and poetic chapter Dostoevsky wrote regarding part of the Russian monk. It is not a sermon, but rather a story. Robin Fewer Miller studies the complexity of form distinguishing the Russian monk, narrative complexity and subtle realization of the novel's epigraph of the seed. This features Zosima's life story. She argues, subtly, diffused the power of Ivan's rebellion. 
The spider's protestation that he has Euclidean or logical mind, Ivan, like his creator Dostoevsky, harnesses the power of story and emotion. Ivan does not bring gentle Alyosha or the reader to the point of wanting to shoot the murderer of a little boy through rational argument. He accomplishes this through the graphic images and gripping stories of children hounded, beaten, and killed. Zogli, hello! Welcome! Welcome to the library! <clears throat> we fall under the spell of the Sima's almost incentatory language, are entranced by the story of his elder brother Markel, and find ourselves arrested by the image of the wise old man praying before the setting sun. But we also share Ivan's indignation as he recounts the tale of Richard, whose life was taken away twice, once symbolically, by the biological parents who have him away as chattel to some shepherds, and then by his social family, his fellow citizens of Geneva, who chop off his head in brotherly fashion. We reel from the vision of the naked, terrified little boy ripped apart by hunting dogs before his mother's eyes. Dostoevsky presents us with contrasting images of equal power that sear themselves on our memory. <laughs> now on the big screen, got myself an iPad. Oh wow, nice, welcome, I hope you enjoy it. I do want to say, a lot of these images describe us so gruesome. Um, I have to say that in Eastern Europe, a lot of these sites, especially at the time, were rather normal and wouldn't... They're shocking, of course, but it's specifically this kind of literature that made people look at them from a different perspective and um humane so to speak way because that's the life and this made them reconsider what they see almost constantly <clears throat> all right whose fate transfixes us whose image lasts longer the bloody mangled body of a little boy or the beatific old man blessing the sitting sun? What sounds resound in our memory? The ecstatic cheers of the schoolboys gathered around Alyosha, or the whimpers of the anguished little girl locked away in a cold park private? Dostoevsky is indeed engaging, <clears throat> not in communication, but in manipulation, as Robert Belknap writes but he manipulates us toward two irreconcilable states of mind with equal passion. The Brothers Karamazov compels many Dostoevsky specialists who conclude that the contest between joyful faith and tormented doubt remains inconclusive. Both extremes, Malcolm Jones writes, of this con contest in Dostoevsky's life persisted to the end. <clears throat> well, the pictures were something very terrifying, when they knew how to set the mood for the book. Oh yeah, for sure. I'm not talking about the book. I'm talking about the people who lived in that area. The Eastern European people. That for them, seeing that was actually not so unusual in a big part of their lives. So actually reading that in a book and being able to distance themselves made them uh, be the ones looking in and realizing how Fucked up it is, yeah, I'll say that. Reading a, a serious book, yeah, how fucked up the reality is. Alright. The Brothers Karamazov doesn't provoke fewer at public gatherings or illicit government decrees anymore, but it retains the power to move us. We respond to Sima's last words, even though our translation is but a faint echo of the original, and despite our ignorance of his prototypes, figures from the Russian spiritual tradition such as Tikhon Zadonsky and the monk Perfeny. For 21st century readers, the novel may most immediately may be most immediately accessible as a steering plot on what Hurst Jurgen Greek calls the realist level of reading. We become engrossed in the crisis of three interesting young men entangled in a complicated web of erotic uh, intrigues and gripped by a court drama centered on the fate of a loathsome old man with whom we, as readers, attached to the three brothers, 
are intimately and uncomfortably connected. Dostoevsky confronts us with some of our deepest fears and most disturbing taboos, the death of children, feelings of aggression against our own family, and the experience of obsessive desire. These dimensions of the novel still generate raw emotional power. All right, I'll stop here for another um, five cents. It says some disturbing taboos like uh, aggression against one's own family. It is widely known, I think, and it hasn't changed really. That domestic violence is the most common crime in Russia and Eastern Europe. And of course, it was the same back then. So while from some Western readers, it may get a shock. A lot of Eastern European readers can see themselves as those children or those bystanders because it is that common, sadly. Uh, we won't be getting into like personal um, examples or stories, but um, yeah, Eastern Europe struggles a lot with domestic violence of all kinds. It is not unusual. And so, again, a part of reality. Good evening. Hello, Sakuya, and welcome. Crucial dimensions of the novel remain hidden from us without expert assistance. However, I wrote this book for a few, для немногих, how he says it in Russian, and consider it the culminating point of my work. Erkel says, well, the new generation would be more shocked, I guess. For sure, but not in Eastern Europe still. It still persists today, but now more people talk about it. But again, in the Western world, the prob there are actually spe special um, police units, at least in Ukraine, that deal exactly with, uh, that are trained to deal specifically with domestic violence because the implications are different than just a violent crime. And so, yeah, it's still a huge issue. Um, I think more so than, I think for Western readers, this puts some new light on how it is there, but for others, it makes them just rethink their lives. And yeah, you're right. None of that's politics, by the way. I don't like speaking politics in here. <clears throat> Crucial dimensions of the novel remain hidden from us without expert assistance. However, I wrote this book for a few and consider it the culminating point of my work. Dostoevsky wrote in 1879, this edition enables 21st century English-speaking readers to join the few quoted by reconstructing the novel's origin, original context. Relevant information about Dostoevsky, 19th century Russia, and the Christian tradition renders the novel more intelligible to those without prior knowledge of the author and the cultural and religious traditions that profoundly shaped his art. All aspects of Christian belief in practice, not just those unique to 19th century Russian orthodoxy, have been annotated. Not surprisingly, the music of the original Russian uh, of the original Russian requires the most reconstructive labor. <clears throat> the Sima's last words, Nathan Rosen explains, are quote a mosaic of old Russian literary style. End quote. A tapestry woven from biblical texts, the writings of church figures such as Isaac the Syrian, Dostoevsky's recollections of his visit to the Optimus Pustin monastery. For Dostoevsky and his contemporaries, Rosen argues, the elders' words tapped into a deep well of communal memory. The process of choosing between Ivan and the Simo would have been influenced by this richly layered quality of the Simo's speech. Um, I'll just take a break to ask Sakuya. Ты читал братьев Карамазов? Какие у тебя мысли насчет этой книги? All right, let's continue. The novel is composed of complex speech zones, some difficult to render into English. Melikov and Snigerov use speech forms that signal servility, but their linguistic cues resist facile translation. Church and Slavonic, the, litur the liturgical language of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, permeates the conversions of the Sima, the other monks, and in 
and in parodied form, Fyodor Pavlovich. Rakitin's desperate desire to appear emancipated from all vestiges of traditional authority results in a crude, pseudo-scientific lingo which manages to be both swaggering and cringing. Oh, cringing. The language of the unnamed narrator chronicler captures the quality of conversational speech or inner monologue. It features the run-on sentences, repetitions, and inept or inaccurate turns of phrase that mark our conversation and thoughts, but that look odd when written down. Not everything can be entirely conveyed in translation, but the essays by Matlow and Rosen alert readers to what they are missing and suggest ways of appreciating recalcitrant passages. <clears throat> the linguistic barrier is only the first hurdle with which today's Western reader must contend. The brothers Karamazov has to be open asks to be opened up to a whole world of literature, culture, and biographical allusions. This novel, which explores the role of memory for individuals and communities, is itself, is itself a tissue of memories, fabric spun threads of other texts. Its richly layered quality has inspired scholars to approach it as a, quote, a veritable cornucopia of direct and indirect quotations from other texts, both sacred and secular, ranging from the Bible to Voltaire from Pushkin to popular songs." End quote. Thank you very B BBC for uh, the follow, I appreciate it. Dostoevsky had encyclopedic ambitions for the brothers Karamazov. Before I can start on it, he wrote, I have to read practically a whole library of atheists, Catholics, and Orthodox. The modern reader, who may not be in a position to acquire Dostoevsky's vast learning, will benefit from the extensive annotations provided here. The 21st century reader's path to the brother Karamazov is rendered even more daunting by the extent to which it is saturated, not just with the wide-ranging allusions to the Western tradition, but also <clears throat> with references to Dostoevsky's contemporary Russian environment and his other writings. A moment, my throat again. <clears throat> Where did they stop? Okay, I think it was... Yes. The 21st century's reader path to the Brothers Karamazov is rendered even more daunting by the extent to which it is saturated not just with wide-ranging allusions to the Western tradition, but also with references to Dostoevsky's, con Dostoevsky's contemporary Russian environment and his other writings. Some of the most important memories reverberating through the Brothers Karamazov are of other works of Dostoevsky. One of the most important texts for this novel is his Diary of a Writer, the one-man monthly journal dedicated to often polemical reflections about the people and events making news in his time. Many of the topical references the reader encounters in the Brothers Karamazov are drawn from the diary, which Dostoevsky published in 1873 and then from 1876 to 1877, 1880, and in 1881. We encountered the novel as a discrete, independent text, but Dostoevsky's original readers, readers experienced it as a serialized work sandwiched between issues of the diary. William Mill Todd's essay introduces modern readers into the significance of serialization for understanding Dostoevsky's art. Discussing his philosophy of art in April 1876, Dostoevsky asserted that a writer must describe reality down to the most trivial ex exactitude, mm, historical and contemporary. End quote. He regarded the diary as a laboratory for exploring the topical dilemmas 
he would address in the brothers Karamazov as well. Both works are preoccupied with the state of the Russian family. Whoops, there we go. Fatherhood, child abuse, the role of the environment in character development, and the complexity of guilt and crime. Yeah, that, that, that is one of his most favorite topics, isn't it? And the astounding quantity of cross-references invites us to ponder the relationship between these intimately linked texts by altering readers to the existence, by, sorry, by alerting readers to the existence of these parallels. The annotations provided here open vistas into additional layers of depth and complexity in the novel. Dostoevsky took his role as Russia's, quote, social conscience, end quote, seriously. He regarded the brothers Karamazov like the more overtly topical and, ten and tendentious diary as a work of political import. Zosima's faith, Dostoevsky believed, offered a solution to social as well as individual dilemmas. If I succeed with the character Zosima, he explained to his editor, Nikolai Lubimov, in June 1879, I'll accomplish something good. I'll force them to realize that a pure, ideal Christian is not something abstract, but graphically real, possible, standing before our eyes, and that Christianity is the only refuge from all its ills for the Russian land. Ivan's atheism, the Zosima's faith, has political ramifications. Quote, these convictions, end quote, Dostoevsky writes to Lubimov regarding Ivan's views. Hello, Dark Fanta. Thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate it. I really hope you enjoy your time here and uh, welcome to uh, the library. <clears throat> so regarding Ivan's views, <clears throat> here we have another quote are precisely that which I recognize as the synthesis of contemporary Russian anarchism, the refutation not of God, but of the meaning of his creation. All socialism comes from and began with the refutation of the meaning of historical reality and arrived at a program of destruction and anarchism. And Attacks on biological, divine, and political father figures, the novel suggests, are inextricable. Welcome, Florid Man. Thank you so much for the follow, and welcome to the library. Hmm. Critics have long recognized that Ivan's resentment of a biological father such as Fyodor Pavlovich and his rebellion against the Heavenly Father blend together. The image of the father, Harold Bloom writes, is ultimately also the image of the Tsar and God. My toaster cheated on me with my best friend and the bathtub. He's still here. What the fuck? My toaster? Oh, I would go into that bathtub. The image of a father, Harold Bloom writes, is ultimately also the image of the Tsar and God. The revolutionary energy simmering within Smirnyakov, famous inspiration from Ivan, threatens more than the life of Fyodor Pavlovich. It also poses a threat to the authority of the Tsar's Batushka, or Tsar Father, as he was called by the Russian people. Wait, there are song requests? Oh, yeah, uh, no, don't do them now, please. We are, uh, I, I should probably turn them off during the reading session, along with um, some other stuff, I believe. But, uh, yeah, we are, um, no song requests. And I don't want to pause everything, but, uh, also, please no redeems aside from stretch and hydrate. All right. Thank you, guys. I want the session to be enjoyable for, for all of us. The essays and annotations provided here reveal the extent to which the novel's spiritual dramas are intertwined, intertwined with political dilemmas of the Russian 1860s and 70s. Am I allowed to song request book in a free to OP when it is up? Yeah, you can request really anything when it is up. Just not during our library sessions. Okay. But yeah, I have no limits of what you can request. 
you can still do it. It just probably it may not be played in the VOD because Twitch may censor it, but it will be fun for everyone who will be present uh, live on the stream. And I have no problem with it whatsoever. <clears throat> Knowledge of the novel's complex engagement of contemporary events provides crucial support for reaching informed judgment about the Brothers Karamazov. The reader who knows that Dostoevsky was a passionate reader of newspapers considers his journalistic writings as important as his novels and statured the Brothers Karamazov with references to the contemporary press, especially his own diary of a writer, will be in unique position to assets the crucial chapters the brothers yet acquainted and rebellion. Events Ivan's indictment of God, just as much as the Sima's defense, tapped into a deep well of shared experience. His speech in these chapters is a mosaic of excerpts from the press, something that was a point of pride for Dostoevsky. Responding to accusations that Ivan's accounts of child abuse strained credulity, Dostoevsky protested to Lubimov, quote, Everything my hero says in the text I sent I sent you is based in reality. All the anecdotes about children took place, existed, were published in the press, and I can cite the places I invented nothing." End quote. Ivan's rebellion acquired immeasur immeasurable power for Dostoevsky's original audience through this blurring of fiction in reality. Belknap's study of uh, Rakitin, Kolya Krasotkin, and the schoolboys exemplifies how an informed reader can make sense of the cultural illusions permeating the novel. It's worth noting which passage and characters require the most glossing. Alosha's passage requires very little, whereas the conversations of Kola and Ivan's devil, for example, copy extensive annotation. Kola and the devil are examples of what Miller calls, <clears throat> quote, second tier characters representing aspects or potentials of the main character." End quote. Significant aspects of Ivan, Belknap uh, of Ivan Belknap demonstrates are mirrored in Kola and Rakitin. These second-tier characters are in turn associated with negative cultural prototypes that were familiar to Dostoevsky's reader. Any determination about Ivan and his rebellion that fails to take these complex associations into account is based on incomplete evidence. Dostoevsky, like Dmitri's defense attorney, Petukovich, reminds us that arguments cut both ways. In Russian, one speaks of a stick with two ends. The aura of contemporary culture enhances Ivan's status. The fact that his uh, evidence against God's creation consists largely of real child abuse cases familiar to the public gives way to his condemnation. Yet his association with well-known public figures whose ethical standards seem questionable, Dostoevsky and many others also undermines the status of his complaint. The references to biblical and sacred texts extensively annotated here may pose the greatest interpretive challenges with an extraordinary diversity of opinion among experts regarding their significance. According to one school of thought, the relationship between the novel and the biblical and sacred models it invokes is one of reflection or amplification. The Brothers Karamazov refers to a passage from the Bible or church fathers in order to illustrate and expand on them to provide these passages or teachings with the color and vitality of literary embodiment. The essay of uh, Vyatlovskaya, for example, argues that Dostoevsky drew on the hagiographical tradition of Saint Alexei to create Alyosha Karamazov. Through Alyosha, Vyatlovskaya suggests Dostoevsky brought aspects of an ancient sacred tradition to life. Dostoevsky would have approved of this approach to his novel. He had pedagogical, ped, pedagogical intentions for the brothers Karamazov. He hoped that the invocation of figures such as Alexei and Tikhon would educate Russians about their native spiritual tradition. He modestly claimed that he was transmitting existing truth rather than creating something new. 
Perhaps I will create a grandiose, positive holy figure, he wrote regarding the uh, character who became the Simo. Actually, I won't create anything. I will merely present the real Tihon. And an anonymous mother taught his advice on how to raise her son, Dostoevsky responded, quote, Acquaint him with the Gospels, teach him to believe in God strictly according to the law. This is a sign quo unknown. Otherwise, he won't be a good person. End quote. Responding to another correspondent who bemoaned a loss of faith, Dostoevsky advised, Wouldn't it be best for you to read more carefully the whole of Apostle Paul? Much is said there specifically about faith, and it is not possible to say it better. The author's self-understanding may not be the best guide for in interpreting the novel's relationship to religious tradition. However, it may not be possible to say it better than the Bible, but Dostoevsky was clearly compelled to say it differently. If there was anyone who didn't believe strictly according to the law, it was Fyodor Dostoevsky and his father, Zosimo. A fact that was not lost on many of Dostoevsky's contemporaries. Those who felt entitled to speak for the Russian Orthodox Church criticized poor elements of Zosimo's teachings, the emphasis on joy and this world, for example, as deviating from the true Christian doctrine. When a character like Fyodor Pavlovich quotes sacred texts, it's obvious that he willfully misunderstands the essence of the original, resulting in blasphemy. Zosima, on the other hand, reverse, uh, reverse sacred texts and tradition, yet he too is capable of unconsciously challenging their authority in his own way. Responding to Zosima's complexity, some scholars maintain that the spiritual core of the brothers Karamazov diverges radically from the religious tradition Dostoevsky inherited. <clears throat> These scholars point out that Zosima blatantly flouts Christian doctrine on key points such as suicide, and that he quotes biblical passages selectively, sometimes altering their original meaning. Zosima's enthusiasm for the Book of Job, for example, is based on a highly reductive reading. He leaves much out, Rosen observes, of the Sima's version, and what is left out is revealing. Job's integrity and independence has intellectual and spiritual energy, end quote, resulting in a rendition that is, quote, carefully spurned at Job's defiance and intellectual challenge of God, end quote. Some scholars maintain that the former of spirituality embodied by Zosima and Melosha were derived from diverse sources, such as Western Romanticism and Idealism. In their opinion, the traces left by these traditions predominate over the Christian elements. Roger Anderson argues that Zosima's beliefs contain significant elements of Slavic pag paganism and owe more to mythic consciousness than Christian theology. Readers have always sought Dostoevsky in the Brothers Karamazov. Quote, I put much of myself and what is mine into it, end quote, he wrote of this novel. Ivan was molded, sorry, Ivan was modeled, modeled on many contemporary figures, but the most significant source for this character was probably, probably, wow, that's the most Russian accent I've had in years. was probably Dostoevsky himself. As Miriam points out, Dostoevsky's hero, like all the Karamazovs, without exception, is also profoundly autobiographical. This edition supplies readers with relevant biographical information that suggests intriguing parallels linking, linking Dostoevsky with his characters. One of the most obvious points of similarity between Dostoevsky and Ivan is their preoccupation with children, Dostoevsky's concern for children, his own, those he encounters on the street, those he read about in the newspapers accounts of crimes committed by and against children, those whose fates he followed at sensational trials, stands at the center of the spiritual biography and writings. A, spe a specific type, child, occupies center stage in this novel. The dead child. Dostoevsky and his wife Anna Grigorievna were familiar with the loss of children. 
Their first child, a daughter named Sophia, died in infancy in 1868. Their second son, Alexei, died in May 1878. When Dostoevsky was in the early stages of work on the brothers Karamazov, mm, is when it happened. Alexei Dostoevsky, like the little boy demoned by the peasant mother in the chapter Peasant Woman Who Have Faith, died three months before his third birthday. Three years old, but three months. Wails that in inconsolable parent. The outpouring of grief for a dead, injured, or suffering child constitutes the fundamental groundswell to this novel. Miller writes, Dostoevsky instilled in the brothers Karamazov his own grief and love for his dead child, Alexei. Devastated by his son's death, Dostoevsky sought solace from a visit to Optimus Per Pustin, where he encountered the elderly Ambrose, a prototype of Father Zasimu. The novel is unquestionably imbued with Dostoevsky's parental grief, but this morning is counterbalanced by a fervent belief in, or is it insistence on, resurrection. Throughout his life, Dostoevsky asserted that belief in immortality was a cornerstone of Christian faith. In his attempts to convince himself and others, he sometimes pursued an interesting line of argument, the essence of which is suggested by characters in the novel and outlined in one of his letters included here. In this letter, written during the early stages of work on the brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky deduces proof of immortality through the following argument. The law of self-preservation, or self-interest, also egoism, obtains, obtains on earth, but human beings sense the existence of another realm where this law is nullified. Quote, <clears throat> man strives on earth toward an ideal that is contrary to his nature. He has written in his 1864 notebooks, the fact that we sense the possibility of transcending this law and yearn to do is evidence that we do not belong entirely to the earth or fall exclusively under its jurisdiction. According to Dostoevsky, the desire to transcend the self, the desire to accede to a law higher than that of self preservation proves that we are not doomed to the death sentence decree on earth hello simi welcome 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 to the library i hope you enjoy your stay here and i'm glad to see that you are joining us today one key aspect of dostoevsky's belief in immortality which he imputes to alyosha karamazov might be overlooked or misunderstood without annotation. You have done half the work towards being saved, Alyosha tells Ivan, because you love life. <clears throat> now you must complete the second half. You must raise up your dead, who perhaps have not died at all. This enigmatic comment invites closer scrutiny. According to Alyosha, Ivan cannot be saved until he adopts a certain relationship to the resurrection of his forefathers. He, Ivan, must take responsibility for their resurrection and raise them up. In a letter of March 1878, Dostoevsky asserted that the living must bring about the resurrection of their forebears. We have, quote, the duty of resurrecting ancestors who lived before, end quote, he claimed. It would be a mistake to conceive of his resurrection, quote, intellectually, allegorically, end quote, he cautioned, and insisted that, the resurrection will be real, personal, that the abyss separating us from the souls of our ancestors will be filled in, and they will be resurrected not only in our consciousness, not allegorically, but actually, individually, materially in bodies, the Alma Ftilach. Alyosha's seemingly offhand comment sheds light on the essential quality of Dostoevsky's faith. Dostoevsky consistently defends the miraculous within Christianity, rebutting any claims that Christian faith could be a matter of morals or ethics, shorn or belief in the divinity of Christ or personal resurrection. Dostoevsky's voice resounds throughout this deeply autobiographical novel, but other voices speak as well. 
one of Dostoevsky's most famous readers, the Russian philosopher and literary critic Mikhail Bakhtin, characterized Dostoevsky as a profoundly dialogical writer who orchestrated open conversations among different viewpoints in his novels. Bakhtin's contention that Dostoevsky's novels are polyphonic or multi-voiced has, had, has had a considerable impact on our understanding of Dostoevsky. In serious engagement with the brothers Karamazov must grapple with Bakhtin's legacy. Ulrich Schmidt's essay suggests that we can enrich our appreciation of the polyphonic quality of Dostoevsky's novels by realizing that what appears to be dialogue or debate among uh, different characters, sorry, among different ideologies, no, <laughs> different ideological viewpoints represented by different characters may in fact be a form of monologue. The Karamazov brothers, Schmidt argues, function as components of complex consciousness, and a dialogue among them can be most accurately understood as a form of monologue carried out by elements of a higher order consciousness. Two of the most important characters, Ivan and Alyosha, are authors themselves, and their texts, The Grand Inquisitor and Note of the Life in God of the Deceased Hero Monk, The Elder is a Seaman, taken from his own words by Alexei Fyodorovich Karamazov, form the core of the novel. Dostoevsky stressed Alyosha's independence as a writer. There is, there is introduced into the novel as it were a foreign document, the notes of Alexei Karamazov. He explained to Lupinov in August uh, 1879, and this document is copied down by Alexei Karamazov in his own way. Dostoevsky sees some of the most important passages in the brothers Karamazov to other authors with distinct voices. Oh, Niwa, hello! Hello, Niwa. Um, is it Emmy or Edgardo? Or maybe Erika? But uh, regardless, welcome. I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you'll enjoy your time with us in the library. Don't worry, guys. We're almost through the introduction. If you already... Um, I get growing tired. One task of this vision is to orchestrate a dialogue among readers. The critical essays were selected not only because they shed light on important dimensions of the novel, but also uh, because their juxtaposition vividly illustrates the multiplicity of perspectives the brother Karamazov uh, continues to inspire. Where we are involved with Dostoevsky versus Dostoevsky, Robert Louis Jackson writes, and that is almost always the case in his major novels, there is not likely to be an answer or voice that definitively rounds out the other contending voices. When a novel as complex as the brothers Karamazov is under consideration, these essays demonstrate no single voice can have the last word. The dialogical quality of Dostoevsky's writing produced dialogue among his readers. The variety of informed responses this text can support is exemplified here by the varied appraisals of Smelyakov and the uh, contest between Ivan and Zosim. Scholars agree that the brothers Karamazov represents a powerful investigation into the source of human behavior, exploring what drives some individuals to transgress the most sacred bonds and what holds others back. The essays of Belknap, Garrick, Goldstein, and Cantor offer very different assessments of each brother's role in the, in the violence. Like Miller, Rosen focuses on properties of the text that sway the reader toward agreement with Zosima, arguing that the artistic picture crafted by Zosima wins the debate with Ivan about God. Morrison, on the other hand, declares that Ivan definitely repudiates both God, as defended by Zosima, and Christ, as defended by Alyosha, but argues that the novel shifts the locus of debate from an argument about the Father and Son to a victory for the Holy Spirit. For all its complexity, there is no question that the brothers Karamazov 
ends with joy. The rapturous hope that rings throughout the final scene can be found in Dostoevsky's correspondence from this period as well. There is no doubt that new people are coming and will soon arrive, so there is no cause for grieving and lamenting. Let us be worthy to recognize and meet them. He exhorts a correspondent in a letter uh, from March 1878. The conclusion of the Brothers Karamazov brings out ecstatic heights, but it also leaves us with the question, how do we make ourselves worthy to meet these new people, the newly articulate and charismatic Alyosha, and the beaming boys gathered around him? As he was composing the novel, Dostoevsky wrote in his notebooks, we are all, to the last man, Fyodor Pavlovich's. How we, must ask, how we must ask ourselves, when the rapture subdies, will we transcend our inner Fyodor Pavlovich and be worthy to partake the joy the novel promises? <clears throat> oh, it's just Lama now follows you. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to the library, Lama. I hope, uh, I hope you will enjoy your time here. And it's been exactly one hour since I started streaming, so I just wanted to thank all of you for uh, coming and joining, and I hope you are enjoying your Sunday as I am. It's uh, a very nice weather today, and I am surrounded by you, who, all of whom I very much enjoy, so I hope you will enjoy your time here. All right, let's continue. We're almost done with the introduction. I think our music is done so we're about to start a new one just a moment this one might be a bit too much Okay. I'm also going to take a sip of water as it's been an hour of talking. Oh, jazz playlist. Mm. We can put on some more uh, Russian classical music. The jazz would be nice. What would you guys like? We can put on Rachmaninoff. What do you think about that? It is one of my uh, favorite composers. Almost out of water. How funny. Every day and every hour, every minute, walk around yourself and watch yourself and see that your image is a seemly one, Zosima commands the monks. The essence of the brothers Karamazov is strict and demanding, calling for constant self-scrutiny and self-control. Regarding the loving humility, Zosima urges, Carol Emerson writes, there is nothing passive or easy about this humility. Zosima reminds us, it's extremely hard work. In the brothers Karamazov, all are called upon to manifest their reality, of goodness which must emerge from our daily myriad interactions very important book aside but you should really think about every single interaction you do be kind to other people and uh, act with humility anyway the brothers karamazov all are called upon to manifest the reality of the heavens give no pledge, wait, no, the reality of goodness, yeah, okay, when the, quote, heavens give no pledge, end quote, as Ivan says, quoting Schiller, the existence of goodness is always at stake and dependent on each of us. Anyone in position to influence others, and that, according to this novel, is all of us, at all times in our daily lives, must constantly model uh, your behavior. 
This emphasis on practicing or exemplifying goodness rather than asserting that one is good or demanding respect has interesting implications for the novel's approach to biological parents and the divine father. Alright, I think perhaps this is a bit too fast, so let, um, let's see. One more Beethoven, maybe? This emphasis on practicing or exemplifying goodness rather than asserting that one is good or demanding respect has interesting implications for the novel's approach to biological parents and the Divine Father, whose goodness Ivan calls into question. Parents especially, Dostoevsky cautions, flout this injunction at their own risk. Before he composed the tragic story of Fyodor Pavlovich, Dostoevsky... Um, one moment, my carpet here is being wet. Yes. Okay. Dostoevsky admonished a real parent with the dangerous possibility that her child could cease to love her. Imagine that your child comes to you and asks you or his father such a question. Why should I love you and why should this be my duty? Dostoevsky warns the mother to whom he recommended the Bible that she must constantly model good conduct, acting so that the question never arises for her child. Be good and let your child understand that you are good, himself, about hints. And for this he will remember you, uh, your image, with great respect for his entire life. The decision to love is a choice. Any attempt to demand love or difference as parental privileges, Dostoevsky explains to a real parent while composing the brothers Karamazov, is doomed to failure. And I think that's not the case only with parental love, with any kind of love, so remember that. In his retelling of the Book of Job, Zosima overlooks Job's challenge to God, but he also omits God's reaction to Job's rebellion. As Rosen points out, Zosima neglects to mention the power of coercion God exercises in the Bible. No voice from the whirlwind asserts this out authority in the brothers Karamazov. Assertion and coercion are emphatically rejected as the basis for relations between the Divine Fathers and his children, sorry, Divine Father, very important, one singular father, and his children, as well as between biological parents and children. In the absence of divine authority and absence of a vacuum implied by Zosima's decision to pass over in silence, the coercive power present in the Book of Job, authority is transferred to human beings. The power of the biblical creator, or an authority figure such as the Grand Inquisitor, is transformed into individual responsibility, into what Miller calls, mm, quote, a radically egalitarian responsibility of each for all and all for each, end quote. Dostoevsky sensed what this novel would mean for his legacy, and suffered while writing it. It's necessary to finish it well, to polish it like a jewel, but it's difficult and risky thing. It depletes my strength, he wrote his wife in August of 1879. But it's also faithful. I must establish my name, otherwise there is no hope. After completing the brothers Karamazov, he confessed. In some difficult moments of inner accounting, I often realize with pain that I literally have not expressed a twentieth of what I wanted, and perhaps could express. At these times, the only thing that saves me is the hope that God will someday send enough inspiration and strength so that I will express myself fully in a word that I will speak out everything that is contained in my heart and fantasy. I feel that there is more hidden in me than I have been able to express till now as a writer. Despite more than 100 years of engagement with the brothers Karamazov, we still have not apprehended everything it has to offer. This volume seeks to inspire new generations to mine its depths and equip them with the tools to do so. 
And so we ended the introduction. Now, we do have, uh, there is a short part here that describes all the names and where they are uh, taken from. Not too long and I think perhaps worth reading. There is also a note from the author which is much shorter than the introduction. So I think it might be worth reading because just this to himself. It's a page and a half of how he chooses to introduce his own book. I think we should read it. So let me just take another sip of my coffee here. And I hope you are all enjoying your time here as much as I am enjoying your company. Beep boop space support queen x space welcome welcome to the library i hope you will enjoy your time here how are you doing today i really uh, thought that was a great introduction it's both fair and showing so yeah it's very important to understand where the author came from and what writing such a book in that time meant or what he tried to convey and failed to thank you for the follow space welcome to my library i'm just gonna take a sip of my tea here mm. i apologize All right, so we're getting space support here, both Queen Space and Spacer. That's a lot of space support. That's a lot of support. Now I definitely know I can do it. All right, let's keep going. Russians have three names, a first or given name, a uh, patronymic and a last or family name. Patronymics are derived from the first name of the father and are modified according to gender. A son acquires his father's first name with the ending Ovich or Yevich. A daughter acquires her father's name with the ending Ovna or Yevna. I'm gonna stop here by the way. For all of you guys who are here to study a bit of Russian, that's a very important part of when you address people. So pay close attention because uh, it will help you a lot of understanding when you're reading Russian names. Guess you can say there's enough space for everyone. Oh man, I need to add a sound effect. I'll download sound effects before next time. Good one. I like that one. Thank you for bringing a smile to my face. For example, <clears throat> I'm continuing. For example, the Karamazov brothers each have a first name, Dmitri, Ivan and Alexei. And all received the patronymic Fyodorovich from their father, as the father is Fyodor. And then we have the Ovich. <clears throat> he in turn received the, patron the patronymic pa Pavlovich from his father, whose first name must have been Pavel, Russian for Paul. If there were Karamazov's sister, her patronymic would be Fyodorovna. Family names like patronymics are declined according to gender. Li Liza uh, Koklakova, deceased father, would have used the name Koklakov without feminine ending. Uh, a Karamazov sister would bear the name Karamazova. Character names Karamazov. Kara is the Turkish root for black. The Russian root maz signifies tar or grease. Mazet means to smear, coat, paint, or soil. The name Karamazov. Thus means roughly black smear. It may also evoke the Russian word Chernomaze, swarthy. Uh, the Russian root for black is Chern, 
So Ilusha's mother is translating from Turkish to Russian when she calls Alosha Chernamaza. Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov. Fyodor is the Russian form of Fyodor, derived from Greek meaning of gift of God. Dmitry Fyodorovich Karamazov. Mitya, Mitka, Mitinka. The name Dmitry is derived from the ancient Greek goddess of agriculture, Dmitry. Dmitry is a popular Russian name associated with saints worshipped in the Eastern Orthodox Church and with many figures from Russian history. Ivan Fyodorovich Karamazov, Vanya, Vanka, Vanichka. Ivan is the Russian form of John. Alexei Fyodorovich Karamazov, Alyosha, Alyoshka, Alyoshichka, Lyosha, Lyoshichka. Alexei is the name of one of the most beloved saints in the Russian Orthodox Church. Pavel Fyodorovich Smerdyakov. Smerd has several meanings in Russian. A bad smell, a man of low origins, a slave or a serf. Smerdyet means to stink. Sofia Ivanova. Sofia means divine wisdom in Greek. It can also be pronounced Sofia with end stress. This sounds more sophisticated to Russian ears and is closer to the Greek pronunciation. Agrafina Alexandrova Svetlova. Rushinka, Grusha. Svet is Russian for light, bright. Grusha means pear. Katerina Ivanovna Verkovstva. Verkh means upper, supreme, proud in Russian. Verkhovny means supreme. Liza Kaklakova. Lysa. Kaho means the crest of a bird or a top knot in Russian. It, it is also, by the way, a um, slang term for Ukrainians. You call them haho. Anyway, Lysa is the French form of Lisa. Upper class Russians like the Kaho, uh, the Kaklakovs often spoke French at home and adopted French versions of their names. Mikhail Rakitin, Misha. Rakitnik means broom, bush in Russian. Ilusha Snigirov, Ilushichka. Ilusha in Ilushichka are nicknames for Ilya, Russian for Elias or Elia. Snig means snow in Russian. Snigir means bullfinch. Harrison's tube, pronounced Ger Gerstin's tube in Russian. Harris is a heart in German. Stube is room or chamber. So a chamber of the heart. Fetukovich, the name implies blockhead in Russian. Zasima, pronounced Zasima in Russian. A great elder and ascetic, Zasimas of Palestine, also uh, spelled Zosimus or Zosimen, is recognized as a saint of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. While fasting and praying in the desert in preparation for Lent, he encountered Saint Marie of Egypt. Kola Krasotkin. Kola is the short form of Nikolai. Krasata means beauty in Russian. Grigory Vasilievich Kutsov. The name Grigory, Russian for Grigory, Gregory, is derived from Greek meaning watchful or awake. Russian readers would associate the name Kutuzov with Field Marshal Mikhail Kutuzov, the military hero whose tactics contributed to Russia's defeat of Napoleon in 1812. Marta Ignatyevna Kutuzova. Her name may allude to the Martha in the Gospels, see John 11, 1-28. All references to the Bible are to the King James Version. Maximov, Pyotr Alexandrovich Musov, Pirochtin. Nicknames. Russian is rich in nicknames and diminutives. Papa and Mama, for example, yield a variety of forms, such as Papinka, Maminka, Papasha and Mamasha. The longer the nickname, the more intimate and affectionate it is. For example, Mitinka and Ilushichka are more diminutive and intimate than Mitya and Ilusha. Place names Chernomashny stems from the Slavonic words for vermilion or red. Dostoevsky's father bought a village named Chernomaznya in 1832. Now remember that Chernomaznya is very similar to the Smerdyakov. A reference. So let's keep going. Mokre means wet in Russian. Suhoi 
поселок means dry hamlet so that is or or like dry village or like dry uh yeah Skata Prigon uh, Skota Prigonevsk, based on the word Skata Prigonka, stockyard, derived from Scot, Russian for cattle or livestock. Alright, so that is all for the names. I hope that was not too confusing for uh, any and all of you. And so also welcome to the stream, Damien. I hope you will enjoy um this reading of the brothers another sip <clears throat> all right i feel like i should have been taking notes um i don't think you should have it's fine and any questions guys even if it's something that was said uh, feel free to ask i'll explain it's all good but, all right here we go from the outdoor just one and a half pages but let's let's see Let, let's hear what um dostoevsky wanted us to know before we start reading his novel in beginning the life story of my hero alexei fyodorovich karamazov i find myself in somewhat of a quandary Namely, although I call Alexei Fyodorovich my hero, still I myself know that he is by no means a great man, and hence I foresee such unavoidable questions as these. What is so remarkable about your Alexei Fyodorovich that you have chosen him as your hero? What has he done? What is he known for and by whom? Why should I, the reader, waste time learning the facts of his life? The last question in the most faithful for it, uh, faithful, for to it I can only answer, perhaps you will see for yourself from the novel. <clears throat> well, suppose you read the novel and fail to see, and so do not agree that my Alexei Fyodorovich is remarkable. I say this because, unhappily, I foresee it. For me, he is remarkable, but I doubt strongly whether I shall succeed in proving this to the reader. The thing is, perhaps, that he is a protagonist, but a vague and undefined protagonist. And in truth, in times such as ours, it would be strange to require clarity of people. One thing, I dare say, is fairly certain. This man is odd, even eccentric. But oddness and eccentricity interfere rather than help, especially when everyone is trying to put the particulars together and to find some sort of common meaning in the general confusion. In most cases, the eccentric is a particularly a separate element. Isn't that so? Now, if you do not agree with this last thesis and answer not so, or it isn't always so, then I might perhaps become encouraged and encouraged about the significance of my hero, Alexei Fyodorovich. For not only is an eccentric not always a particularly and a separate element, but on the contrary, it happens sometimes that such a person, I dare say, carries within him self the very heart of the whole and the rest of the men of his epoch have for some reason been temporarily turned from it as if by a gust of wind still i should not have plunged into these quite uninteresting and confused explanations and should have begun quite simply without introduction if they like it they will read it but the trouble is that I have two novels and only one life story. The main novel is the second. It is the action of my hero in our day, at the very present time. The first novel takes place 13 years ago, and it is hardly even a novel, but only one moment in my hero's early youth. I cannot do without this first novel, because much in the second novel would be unintelligible without it. But in this way, my original difficulty is rendered still more complicated. If Ayates, the biographer himself, find that even one novel might perhaps be superfluous for such a modest and undefined hero, then how can I appear with two, and now on my part can I justify such presumption? Hmm. 
finding myself lost in the solution of these questions, I decide to bypass them with no solution at all. Of course, the astute reader has long since guessed that from the very first I was leading up to this and was annoyed with me for wasting fruitless words and precious time. To this I shall answer explicitly, I was spending fruitless words and, and precious time first out of courtesy and second out of shrewdness. Still, the reader might say, he has forewarned us of something. Indeed, I am actually glad that my novel has uh, of itself split into two narratives. With essential unity of the whole, having become acquainted with the first tale, the reader will then decide for himself whether it is worth his while to attempt the second. Of course, no one is bound by anything. He can abandon the book uh, at the second page of this first story. Never open it again. But then, you know, there are those considerate readers who absolutely must read to the end so as not to be mistaken in their impartial judgment. Such, for example, are all the Russian critics. It is before this type of a person that my heart somehow becomes lighter. Despite all their careful exactness and consci conscientiousness, I nevertheless give them a perfectly legitimate pretext to abandon the story at the novel's first episode. Well, there is the whole foreword. I completely agree, that is superfluous, but since it has already been written, let it stand. And now, to business. And now we have truly gotten through the epilogue, through the writer's word, and we can jump into the novel. <clears throat> no, that was a word from the author. As I said, I would like to see what Dostoevsky wants to tell us about the book. I'm sorry to disappoint. Uh, actually, let me start a chapter here uh, for people who will be watching, maybe. Uh, Pop-out player, advanced. Uh, how do I add a chapter here? Mm, you don't have to read all of that. This book is a very... It's a classical literature and was a very important book of one of the most prominent authors. So there's a lot to say. It has been studied a lot. There has been a lot of editions and I am very interested in literature. So I thought reading this would be interesting, maybe to some of you as well. But of course, it's totally not needed. It's just as valid just to read the book, have your own impression and that's it. Or just to enjoy it. But for those of you who don't have it and want to have the flow of it, you know, you can always rewatch the vlog later, so you can always skip to this part. I provide you both of the options. Book 1. The History of a Certain Little Family. Chapter 1. Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov. Alexei Fyodorovich Karamazov was the third son of Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov, a landowner well known in our district in his own day. And still remembered among us. On to his tragic and obscure death, which happened exactly 13 years ago, in which I shall describe in its proper place. For the present, I will only say that this landowner, for so we used to call him, although he hardly lived on his own estate at all, was a strange type, yet one pretty frequently to be met with, precisely the type of person who is not only trashy and depraved, but also without any sense. But he was one of those senseless people, however, who know how to take care of their little worldly business quite well, and apparently nothing else. Oh no, please don't start us. Fyodor Pavlovich, for instance, began with next to nothing, 
He was a very small landowner. He ran to dine at other men's tables and fastened onto them as a sponger. Yet at his death it appeared that he had hundred thousand rubles in hard cash. At the same time, he was all his life one of the most senseless madcaps in our whole district. I repeat it, it was not stupidity. The majority of these madcaps are shrewd and intelligent enough, but just so senseless and a special national form of it. Uh, guys, I'm just gonna ask you before uh, we continue, is the music too loud or too low? Anything I can do for you? Uh, just, you know, I don't want you. I want you to have the best experience. He was married twice and had three sons. The eldest, Dmitri, by his first wife, uh, and the other two, Ivan and Alexei, by his second. Fyodor Pavlovich, first wife, belonged to a fairly rich and distinguished noble family. Also landowners in our district, the Musefs. How it came to pass that an heiress, who was also a beauty, and moreover one of those lively, intelligent girls, not at all uncommon in this generation, but sometimes also to be found in the last, could have married such an insignificant, puny fellow, as everyone called him. I won't attempt to explain. But I knew a young lady, still of the romantic generation before the last, who after some years of enigmatic love for a gentleman, whom she might quite easily have married at any moment, invented insuperable obstacles to their union, and ended by throwing herself one stormy night into a rather deep and rapid river from a high bank, almost a precipice, and so perished entirely to satisfy her own caprice and to be like Shakespeare's Ophelia. And indeed, if this precipice, a chosen and favorite spot of hers, had been less picturesque, if there had been a prosaic flat bank in its place, most likely the suicide would never have taken place. This is a true fact, and one must assume that in our Russian life, in the last two or three generations, there have been not a few such factors or one similar to it. <clears throat> in the same way, the act of Adelaida Ivanovna Musova was no doubt an echo of foreign ideas and was also due to ir irritation caused by lack of mental freedom. She perhaps wanted to assert feminine independence, to go against social conventions, against this, the despotism of her family and birth, and an obliging imagination persuaded her, only briefly, that Fyodor Pavlovich, in spite of his rank as a sponger, as a sponger, nevertheless was one of the boldest and most ironical people of that epoch that was transitional to everything better when he was actually just an evil buffoon and nothing more. There was also piquancy, in that the affair began with elopement, which greatly flattered Adelaida Ivanovna. Fyodor Pavlovich's social position made him quite ready for any such enterprises at the time, for he passionately desired to make a career one way or another. To attach himself to a good family and get a dowry was very alluring. As for mutual love, it did not, it seems, exist at all. Not on the bride's part, nor on his, even despite the beauty of Adelaida Ivanovna. This was perhaps a unique case of the kind in the life of Fyodor Pavlovich, who was a most sensuous person all his life. Ready to run after any skirt if it gave him an encouragement, she seems to have been the only woman who made no particular impression on him, sensually speaking. One more. All right. Adelaida Ivanovna, immediately after the elopement, instantly realized that she simply despised her husband and nothing more. 
Accordingly, the consequences of the marriage revealed themselves extraordinarily quickly. Although the family actually accepted the event pretty quickly, an appropriate and up apportioned the runway her dory, the spouses began to lead a most disorderly life, and there were everlasting scenes between them. It was said that the young wife showed incomparably more nobility and loftiness than Fyodor Pavlovich, who, as is now known, got hold of all her money, some 25,000 rubles, as soon as she received it, so that those thousands were lost to her forever. The little village and the rather fine townhouse, which formed part of the dowry, he did his utmost for a long time to transfer to his name by means of some deed of conveyance, and he probably would have succeeded simply due to the contempt and disgust, so to say, that he constantly aroused in his spouse with his shameless extortions and entreaties simply from her emotional exhaustion just to get rid of him. But unfortunately, Adelaida Ivanovna family intervened and put a stop to the swindling. It is known for a fact that frequent fight took place between the husband and wife, but according to legend, it was not Fyodor Pavlovich who did the beating, but Adelaida Ivanovna, a hot-tempered, bold, dark-browed, impatient woman possessed of remarkable physical strength. Finally, she left the house and ran away from Fyodor Pavlovich with a destitute seminarian living three-year-old Mitya on her husband's hands. Fyodor Pavlovich immediately introduced a regular harem into the house and abandoned himself to orgies of drunkenness and in the intermissions he would drive all over the province complaining tearfully to each and all of Adelaida Ivanovna's having left him going into details too disgraceful for a husband to mention in regard to his own married life. Most of all, it seemed pleasant and even flattering to him to play the ridiculous role of the injured husband and to recount the details of his insult even with relish and embellishments. One thing that he'd got a promotion. But our Pavlovich, you seem so pleased in spite of your sorrow, Scopper said to him. Many even added that he was glad to appear once more in the role of a buffoon, and that it was simply to make it funnier that he pretended to be unaware of his ludicrous position. But who knows, maybe it was just naive of him. At last, he succeeded in finding the trail of the runway. The poor woman turned out to be in Petersburg, where she had gone with her seminarian, and where she had thrown herself into a life of complete emancipation. Fedor Pavlovich at once began bustling about and making preparations to go to Petersburg. For what reason, he himself could not have said. He would perhaps have really gone, but having determined to do so, he felt at once entitled to fortify himself for the journey by throwing himself into another bout of reckless drinking. And just at that time, his wife's family received the news of her death in Petersburg. She somehow suddenly died, somewhere in a garret, according to one story. Typhus, according to another version, of starvation. Fyodor Pavlovich was drunk when he heard of his wife's death. Then they say that he ran out into the street and began shouting with joy, raising his hands to heaven. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. But according to others... He wept without restraint like a little child, so much so, they say, it was pitiful to look at him, in spite of the repulsion he inspired. It's quite possible that both versions were true, that is, they rejoiced uh, at his release, and at the same time wept for her who released him, both at the same time. In most cases, people, even the wicked, are much more naive and simple-hearted than we suppose, and we ourselves Part two. Chapter 2. He gets rid of his eldest son. Of course, you can imagine what kind of father such a man would be and how he would raise his children. The behavior as a father was exactly what might be expected. That, that is, he wholly and utterly abandoned his child by Adelaida Ivanovna, not from malice towards him, 
or because of any wounded matrimonial feelings, but simply because he completely forgot about him. While he was wearying everyone with his tears and complaints and turning his house into a sink of debauchery, a faithful servant of the family, Grigori, took the three-year-old Mitya into his care. And if he hadn't looked after him, then perhaps there would have been no one even to change the child's little shirt. It happened moreover that the child's relation on his mother's side also seemed to forget about him at first. His grandfather, that is Mr. Musov himself, and Lida Ivanovna's father, was then no longer living. His widowed spouse, Mitya's grandmother, had moved to Moscow and was seriously ill while the sisters were married, so that Mitya remained for almost a whole year in old Grigori's charge and lived with him in the servant's cottage. Even if his papasha had remembered him, however, he could not indeed have been altogether unaware of his existence, he himself would have sent him back to the cottage as the child would only have been in the way of his debaucheries. But it so happened that a cousin of the late Adelaide Ivanovna returned from Paris, Pyotr Alexandrovich Musov, who afterwards lived abroad for many years, but at the time he was still quite a young man, distinguished among the Musovs, enlightened, a man of the capitals and foreign lands, moreover a lifelong European, and toward the end of his life a liberal of the forties and fifties. In the course of his career, he had come into a contract with many of the most liberal men of his epoch, both in Russia and abroad. He had known a proud born and Bakunin personally, and when he was already near the end of his journeys, he especially liked to recall and describe the three days of the February 1848 revolution in Paris, hinting that he himself had almost been a participant on the barricades. This was one of the most comforting recollections of his youth. He had an independent property of about a thousand souls to reckon in the old style. His splendid estate lay on the outskirts of a little town and bordered on the lands of her famous monastery, with which Pyotr Alexandrovich began an endless lawsuit. Almost as soon came into his inheritance concerning the rights of fishing in the river of woodcutting in the forest, I don't know exactly which. He even considered it his civic and light and duty to begin a court case against the clericals. Hearing all about Adelaida Ivanovna, whom he of course remembered, and whom he had at one time been interested, and learning of the existence of Mitya, he intervened in spite of all his youthful indignation and contempt for Fyodor Pavlovich. He made Fyodor Pavlovich acquaintance for the first time. He declared to him straight off that he wished to undertake the child's education. I think perhaps the music will be too intense. We will go back to something like this. Right. Long afterwards, he used to reckon, as a characteristic trait of the man, that when he began to speak to Fyodor Pavlovich about Mitya, for some time he looked completely uncomprehending, as though he had no idea what child they were talking about. And even as though... And even as though he seemed surprised that he had a young son somewhere in the house. If there may have been some exaggeration in Fyodor Alexandrovich's story, Still, there must have been something resembling the truth. But Fyodor Pavlovich really was all his life, out of acting, of suddenly playing an unexpected part in front of him, and most importantly, sometimes without any motive for doing so, even to his own direct disadvantage, as for instance, in the present case. This trait, however, is characteristic of a very great number of people, and even some very intelligent ones, not like Fyodor Pavlovich. Pyotr Alexandrovich carried the business through vigorously and was even appointed among his father Pavlovich, young guardian of the child who had a small property, a house and land left him by his mother. <laughs> you walk away. Thank you, Juicy. I'm glad you're enjoying uh, you're enjoying your time here. I'm very, very glad that you chose to have this. Really. 
I uh, very, very much um, appreciate it. So, thank you, thank you so much. Mita did, in fact, <clears throat> Mita did, in fact, pass into the keeping of his mother's cousin, but the latter had not known of his end. And having arranged and secured the revenues of his estates, he was in a hurry to return to Paris for a long time, and so entrusted the child to one of his own mother's cousins, a Moscow lady. It so happened that having settled in Paris, he too forgot about the child, especially with the advent of the February Revolution, which so struck his imagination and which he could not forget for the rest of his life. The Moscow lady died and Mitya passed into the care one of her married daughters. It seemed he changed his home a fourth time later on. I won't enlarge upon that now, as I shall have much to tell later on Fyodor Pavlovich's first burn, and must confine myself now to the most essential thoughts about him, without which I could not even begin my novel. In the first place, <clears throat> this Dmitri Fyodorovich was the only one of Fyodor Pavlovich's three sons who grew up in the belief that he had soft property and that he would be independent on common age. His boyhood and youth passed in a disorderly way. He did not finish his studies at the gymnasium, then he ended up in military school, then he served in the Caucasus, was promoted, fought a duel, was demoted to the ranks, was promoted again, led a wild life, and spent comparatively large amounts of money. He did not begin to receive any income from Fyodor Pavlovich until he came of age, and until then got into debt. He saw and got to know his father, Fyodor Pavlovich, for the first time on coming of age, when he visited our neighborhood with the purpose of settling with him about his property. It seems he did not like his parents even then. He did not stay long with him and left quickly, having succeeded only in obtaining a sum of money and entering into an agreement for future payments from the estate, of which, a fact worthy of note, he was able to learn neither the revenues nor the value from Fyodor Pavlovich at that time. Fyodor Pavlovich noticed for the first time then, this too should be remembered, that Mitya had a false and exaggerated idea of his property. Fyodor Pavlovich was very satisfied with this, having his own plans. Uh, he simply concluded that the young man was frivolous, unruly, with violent uh, passions, impatient and dissipated, and that if he could obtain ready money, he would be satisfied, although only, of course, for a short time. So Fyodor Pavlovich began to take advantage of this fact, sending him from time to time small dolls, installments, and in the end it so happened that when, four years later, Mita lost patience and appeared in our little town for a second time, in order to completely finalize affairs with his parents, it only turned out, to his great surprise, that he had nothing, that it was even difficult to get an account that he had received the whole value of his property in sums of money from Fyodor Pavlovich and was perhaps even in debt to him. That, by various agreements into which he had of his own desire entered his previous dates, he had no right to expect anything more. And so, and so on. The young man was struck, spitted deceit, cheating, was almost beside himself and seemed to lose his mind, and his very circumstance led to the catastrophe, the account of which forms a subject of my first introductory novel, or rather, the external side of it. But before I pass to that novel, I must say a little of Fyodor Pavlovich's other two sons, Mita's brothers, and of their origin. Alright guys, I will take a short 5 minute break before I come back. So, please stay here or hopefully you will and I shall be back short.
Welcome back. Sorry, I had to refill my water here. Take a little breather. Um, are you enjoying yourselves? Are you having a good time? And Emmy, Emmy, hello, hello. Welcome to the stream, Emmy. I hope um, I hope you're having fun. I was um. I didn't manage to be on your stream in the past few days. That's what I really wanted to. There's just so much stuff going on. But I'm super excited to spend some time with you on Friday. Next week's Friday. Hopefully some before we begin. Just sit around and go and have some fun. I would totally love that. Yeah, it's it's hopefully it will be a little bit um a little bit more chill after the semester ends. I'm really excited guys. We we ah uh, guys. I love you so much, guys. Really, all of you. Every man here is great. Um, I'm considering after maybe a, another chapter or two. Um, playing some Mahjong? Or maybe some other game? What would you like to see? Like, would you like to do something? Have you managed to drink yesterday? Or today? Maybe we could have some little drunk Mahjong tonight but anyway right now at this very moment we are here to read so on to chapter three the second marriage and second children Peter Pavlovich having gotten rid of uh one second I could play Mahjong would you like to drink today two laser I think we're gonna skip this one song. There we go. Why did you learn to read like that? Uh, you're gonna be drinking thing. I need to know now because I gotta tell a certain person I put my cider in the fridge so it's cold. Yes, go do it now. Uh, anything you feel like doing in general Jong since I'm cooking dinner. Ooh, what kind of dinner? Please tell me later. Uh, yeah, I, I would be glad because yesterday didn't work out. Yesterday our Mahjong didn't work out. Uh, yeah, I need to play that, but I'm terrible. If I'm playing The Binding of Isaac Repentance, I will absolutely need your guidance. Uh, yeah, the background music. Let's go. Uh, I didn't read to... I didn't learn to read anywhere, really. I wish I did. I'm learning right now. So I'm glad you're enjoying it, and I hope it will get better with time. I'm really glad you're enjoying it. Alright, let us continue. Fyodor Pavlovich, having gotten rid of four-year-old Mitya, very quickly married a second time. This second marriage lasted eight years. He took the second wife, Sofia Ivanova, also a very young girl, from another province where he had gone upon some small piece of business in the company of some little Yid. Uh, the Yid in a Russian is a, a Jew, like, um, it's like a slang derogatory term for Jew, I think. Though Fyodor Pavlovich Carlos drank and went on the Belshaz, he never neglected investing his capital and always managed his business affairs very successfully, though of course always unscrupulously. Sofia Ivanovna was a little orphan, left in childhood without relations, the daughter of some obscure deacon growing up in the wealthy home of her benefactress, educator and tormentor. An aristocratic old woman, <clears throat> the widow of General Gorka. I do not know the details, but I have only heard that the orphan girl, a mild, meek, and gentle creature, was once taken down from a noose which she had hung from a nail in the storeroom. It was that difficult for her to bear the capriciousness and eternal nagging of this old woman, who was apparently not evil, but had simply become the most insufferable tyrant from idleness. Fyodor Pavlovich offered his hand where inquiries were made about him and he was kicked out, but again, as in his first marriage, he proposed an elopement to the little orphan. 
it's very very possible that she would not have married him for anything if she had known a little more about him in time but she lived in another province besides what could a little girl of 16 know about it except that she would be better at the bottom of the river than remaining with her benefactress. So the poor child exchanged a benefactress for a benefactor. Fyodor Pavlovich did not get a penny this time, for the general's widow was furious, gave them nothing, and on top of it all, cursed them both. But he had not counted on getting anything this time. He was enticed simply by the remarkable beauty of the innocent girl, and mainly by her innocent look, which struck him as sensualist who, until this time, had been a depraved connoisseur of exclusively coarse feminine beauty. Those innocent eyes slit my soul like a razor, he used to say afterward, with his loathsome snigger. In a man so deprived, uh, so depraved, this, of course, could only be sensual attraction. As he had gotten no reward, Fyodor Pavlovich did not stand on ceremony with his spouse and took advantage of the fact that she was, so to speak, guilty before him and that he had practically taken her from the noose. He took advantage, moreover, of her phenomenal humility and meekness to trample even on the most ordinary decencies of marriage. In his home, in his wife's presence, loose women would gather and orgies took place. As a characteristic trait, I may report that Grigori, the gloomy, stupid, obstinate, argumentative servant who had hated his first mistress, Adelaide Ivanovna, this time took the side of his new mistress, defending her and abusing Fyodor Pavlovich in a manner little befitting a servant, and once even broke up the orgy and drove all the disorderly women out of the house. Later, something occurred with this unhappy young woman who had been terrorized since childhood, that was like some kind of nervous feminine illness, most often encountered among the peasants in the village women, who were called shriekers because of this illness. From this illness, with its terrible hysterical fits, the sick woman at times even lost her reason. Yet she bore Fedor Pavlovich two sons, Ivan and Alexei, the first in the first year of marriage, and the second three years later. When she died, the little boy Alexei was in his fourth year, and, strange as it seems, I know that he remembered his mother all his life, as if in a dream, of course. At her death, almost exactly the same thing happened to the two little boys as to their elder brother, Mita. They were completely forgotten and abandoned by their father, and fell to that same Grigori and landed in his cottage. And in that cottage, they were found by the tyrannical old general's widow, their another's benefactress and educator. She was still alive. And in all that time, all those eight years, had not been able to forget the insult done to her. For all those eight years, she had been getting the most precise information underhandedly as to her Sophie's manner of life. And hearing how sick she was and what disorder surrounded her, she pronounced aloud two or three times to her lady spongers, It serves her right. God has sent it to her for her ingratitude. Oh, you're, uh, are you leaving? If you are, um, I'm glad you enjoyed it and thank you for joining. I'm, I'm really happy that, um, you like it here. I would love to see you here again sometime, if possible. Exactly three months after Sofia Ivanova's death, the general widow suddenly appeared in our town in person um, and went straight to Fyodor Pavlovich's house. She spent only half an hour in town, but she did a great deal. It was evening. Fyodor Pavlovich, whom she had not seen for those eight years, was a little drunk when he came out to her. The story is that she instantly, without any explanation, as soon as she saw him, gave him two good resounding slaps and jerked him three times up and down by the thrift of hair, then, without adding a word, went straight to the cottage for the two boys. Seeing at first glance that they were unwashed and in dirty linen, she promptly gave Grigory a slap and announced to him that she would take both children home with her, then she led them out as they were wrapped them in plaid blanket 
put them in the carriage and drove off to her own town. Grigory accepted the blow like a devoted slave. Without a word, and when he escorted the old lady to her carriage, he made her a low bow and pronounced impressively that God would repay her for the orphans. You are a blockhead all time, the old lady shouted to him as she drove away. Fyodor Pavlovich, thinking it over, decided that it was a good thing that in his formal agreement regarding his children's upbringing by the general's widow, he did not object to a single point. As for the slaps he had received, he himself drove all over the town, telling the story. It so happened that the old lady, the lady died soon after this, but she left the boys in her will a thousand rubles each for their instruction, and so that all this money be spent only on them, with the condition that it be so portioned out as to last till they are twenty-one. For such a handout is more than enough for such children, and if anyone wants to, then let him open his own purse, etc., etc. I did not read the will myself, but I heard there was, in fact, something strange in that sort, uh, of the sort, and very distinctively expressed. The old woman's principal heir, however, turned out to be an honest man, the provincial marshal of the nobility of that province. Yefim Pyotrovich Polyanov, writing to Fyodor Pavlovich and instantly guessing that it was impossible to drag anything out of him for the education of his own children, although he never directly refused, but always procrastinated in such cases, sometimes even pouring out sentimentalities. He took a personal interest in the orphans and came to especially love the younger, or the younger of them, Alexei, so that he even grew up in his family for a long while. I asked the reader to know this at the very beginning, and if the young people were indebted to anyone for their education and upbringing for their whole lives, it was to this Yefim Pyotrovich, a most generous and humane person, one of those who are seldom found. He kept the, the thousand rubles left to each boy by the general's window, it, widow intact, so that by the time they came of age it had grown to two thousand rubles for each, uh, by the accumulation of interest, and he educated them both at his own expense, and certainly spent far more than a thousand rubles upon each of them. I won't enter into detailed account of their boyhood and youth for the time being, but will mention only a few of the most important circumstances. Of the elder Ivan, I will report only that he grew into a somewhat morose uh, and reserved, though far from timid boy, who, it seems, at ten years old, had already realized that they were growing up in someone else's family and on other people's charity, and that their father was a man of whom it was disgraceful to speak. This boy, very early, almost in his infancy, so they say at least, began to show some sort of brilliant and unusual aptitude for learning. I don't know precisely why, but it somehow happened that he left the family of Ifim Pyotrovich when he was hardly 13, entering one of Moscow's gymnasiums and boarding with some experienced and then famous pedagogue, pedagogue with like a teacher, an old friend of Yefim Spiotrovich from childhood. The man himself used to say afterwards that it was all due, so to speak, to the ardor for good works of Yefim Piotrovich, who was captivated by the idea that the boy's genius should be trained by a teacher of genius. But neither Yefim Pyotrovich nor the teacher of genius was living when the young man finished at the gymnasium and entered the university. Since Yefim Pyotrovich had not managed things well and the receipt of the children's own money left by the tyrannical old general's widow, which had grown with interest from one to two thousand rubles each, was delayed due to various completely uh, unavoidable formalities in Russia. The young man was in great straits for the first two years of the university, since he was forced this whole time to feed and support himself and to study at the same time. Very relatable, I must say. Anyway, it must be noted that he did not even attempt to write to his father at the time, perhaps from pride, from contempt for him, or perhaps from his cool common sense which told him that from such a papinka he would not get any real assistance. However, that may have been, the young man was by no means at a loss and succeeded in getting work. 
At first, 20 kopiek lessons and afterwards running around to newspaper publishers and submitting little 10-line articles on street incidents signed eyewitness. These little articles, they say, were always so interestingly and piquantly done that they quickly became popular and even in this alone the young man showed his practical and intellectual superiority over that numerous, eternally needy uh, and unhappy part of our student youth of both sexes which typically hangs around the doors of various newspapers and journals in the capitals unable to think up anything better than the eternal repetition of one and the same request for French translations or copyright. Having once got in touch with the editors, Ivan Fyodorovich always kept up his connection with them. And in his last years at the university, he published brilliant reviews of books upon various special subjects, so that he became a well-known in literary circles. But he only very recently suddenly succeeded in attracting the attention of a far wider circle of readers, so that a great many people noticed and remembered him. This was rather a curious incident. When he had just left the university and was preparing to go abroad on, upon his 2,000 rubles, Ivan Fyodorovich suddenly published in one of the more important journals a strange article, one that attracted the attention even of non-experts and most importantly on a subject it seems completely unfamiliar to him as he graduated in the natural sciences. The article dealt with a question that was being raised everywhere at the time about uh, ecclesi ecclesiastical courts. Uh, considering several opinions already given on the question, he also expressed his own personal view. The main thing was the tone and the remarkably unexpected conclusion, and yet many from the church decided to consider him one of their own. But suddenly, alongside them, not only secularists, but all even atheists began to applaud from their side. Finally, some clever people decided that the whole article was nothing more than an impudent farce and mockery. Oh, I totally forgot. I am so sorry. You could always tell me. Oopsie. Alright. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mention this incident particularly because this article in time penetrated into the famous monastery in our neighborhood where they were particularly interested in the newly arisen questions by the ecclesiastical courts. It penetrated and produced complete bewilderment. Learning the author's name, they were also interested in the fact that he was a native of the town and the son of that very same Fyodor Pavlovich. And at that very same time, the author himself suddenly appeared among us. Why Ivan Fyodorovich came to us then, I remember that even at that time I asked myself this question with oh, some kind of uneasiness. This so fateful arrival, which served at the start so many consequences, remained for a long time afterward almost always something unclear for me. In general, it was strange that, young, that a young man who was so learned, so proud and simply cautious should suddenly appear in such a disorderly house before such a father who had ignored him all his life, who didn't know or remember him, and who, although he would never, of course, have given him money for anything or under any circumstances if his son had asked for it, nevertheless, his whole life feared that his sons Ivan and Alexei would also come someday and ask for money. And here the young man settles in the house of such father, who lives with him for a month, then another, and they are on the best possible terms. This last fact especially amazed not only me, but many others as well. Fyodor Alexandrovich Musov, about whom I have already spoken, a distant relative of Fyodor Pavlovich throughout his first wife happened to be among us again at that time, on his nearby estate visiting from Paris, where he had already permanently settled. I remember that it was precisely he who was more amazed than anyone 
when he made the acquaintance of a young man who interested him extremely, and with whom he sometimes, not without an inner pang, had intellectual altercations. He is proud, he used to say about him. He will never be in want of money. He has money enough to go abroad even now. What does he want here? It's clear to everyone he hasn't come for money. Because his father would never give him any. He doesn't like wine or dissipation, and yet his father can do without him. They get on so well together. That was the truth. The young man even had an unmistakable influence over his father. The latter almost began to seemingly obey him at times, although he was extremely and even spitefully perverse sometimes. He actually began to behave himself more decently at times. Yeah. It became clear only later that Ivan Fyodorovich had come partially at the request of and on behalf of his older brother Dmitri Fyodorovich, whom he met and saw for the first time in his life. Also, at almost that very same time, on this very visit, but with whom, however, he had entered into correspondence regarding one important matter more concerning Dmitry Fyodorovich before his arrival from Moscow. What that business was, the reader will learn fully in due time in detail. Yet even then, when I already knew of this special circumstance, Ivan Fyodorovich still seemed to me an enigmatic figure, and his arrival Mongas inexplicable. I may add that Ivan Fyodorovich appeared at a time in the guise of a conciliator and mediator between his father and his elder brother Dmitry Fyodorovich, who was in open quarrel with his father and even planning to bring formal action against him. <clears throat> this little family, I repeat, now came together for the first time and some of its members saw each other for the first time in their lives. Only the younger brother, Alexei Fyodorovich, had already been among us for about a year, having been the first of all the brothers to arrive. It's about this Alexei that I find it most difficult to speak in the introduction to my story, before bringing him on the scene in the novel. But it is necessary to write an introduction about him as well, if only to explain in advance one very strange fact, namely. I am forced to present my future hero to the reader from the first scene of this, his novel in the cassock of a novice. Yes, he had been living in our monastery for about a year at that time, and, it seemed, was preparing to shut himself up there for the rest of his life. End of chapter 3、Have、to l e a n on me, well, a pleasure as always. Oh, I'm so so happy that you enjoyed your time here. Thank you for joining. We're actually done with、um, the Brothers Karamaza for now, so、uh, good time. See you, Juicy, and thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. So, how are you guys feeling? Nice and rested. That's good to hear. Feeling pretty good. That's awesome. This has been a、um, two hour session. Learned something new about Albert, actually. Oh, that's nice. Always interesting. I would continue, but yeah, it's a bit、um, strain on the throat. I think I should.、Um, I think I should train a little bit more in.、Um, Speaking a lot, you know, last time I think the session was three hours, but we took a lot of breaks to talk, like not to read, just to respond to stuff.、Um, but I hope you did enjoy it, and I hope with time、uh, my reading sessions will、um, go longer. Yeah, exactly. So, would you guys 
like to watch him play some mahjong and participate perhaps? Yes, Daniel? Make sure your voice isn't sore on April 9th. Yeah, that's most important, but there's still a week until then. It may be sore on the day after, which is probably gonna be also um, a reading day. So, Laser, how do you feel about some mahjong and some drinking? Maybe Neko could let you on as well? By the way, guys, um, a bit of topic, but... Um, a Mongols counter for... I need an, Okay, for the next time we continue, we can have a counter. At a Neko, but he didn't respond. Gonna be a few rackets before friend matches. Gonna do. Uh, probably, yeah. Uh, I'll still let the laser just be on call with me. Yeah, we do. But sadly, they. It's not a word. It's two words, at least in the book. Um. Could join. It's it's two words. Um. Anyway, what I want to say that tomorrow it's my birthday. I kind of have an idea of what we are going to do. Um, I am usually not the most cheery person on my uh, birthdays, um, but I know what I'm sort of uh, in need of. So we'll be doing an event that I will announce soon on my Twitter. And you are all uh, welcome to join. Oh, what a timely manner for this song. Uh, of course, we'll be doing some drinking, there will be some little reveals, and um, we have a little bit of something planned, it's really not uh, worthwhile. You remembered, really? <laughs> I'm so happy, thank you, I'm so, I'm so glad you did, actually. It makes me happy to know that. Uh, stream ending, but I will restream in 10 minutes because we are going to be doing Mahjong. You are more than welcome to join. So, yeah, I will be wrapping up this reading session, guys, and I will be starting on Mahjong if you guys are interested in joining. Uh, I would love to have your company. I just uh, need to change my clothes and clean up our, around here. I can't leave the library this way, especially not the tea here with all the ants. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for coming and... If you liked it, please let me know and hopefully we'll continue next week. The book is quite long. I don't know if you guys would be interested in or like to get through all of it, but I think I'd mind. My throat mind, but that's it. Thank you for the reading, Miwa. A great thing to hear literature I have not been able to read. We are only in the very beginning, but I hope you enjoyed it and uh, maybe it picked your interest. I, uh, nobody has to play. I'm mainly I'll be playing. I just I just love your company, guys. Really, that's that's what matters. Just having fun. So yeah, thank you, everyone. I will be back soon. <laughs>